Davis, and today I'll be telling you all about what I learned while working with an organization that develops interactive educational software. Let me start by introducing myself and the team I work with. I'm a junior here at Berea College, double majoring in computer science and math. This summer I worked alongside fellow computer scientists Michael Moore and Dusty Cole under the supervision of physics professor Dr. Martin Viette while working on our fractions introduction simulation. Before I start talking about the project itself, I think it would be a good idea to start with the how and the why. So during my freshman year, I was accepted into the Entrepreneurship for the Public Good Institute where I learned about what it meant to be an entrepreneur and how to live an extraordinary life. As part of the second part of my two-year program, I was tasked with finding an internship so I could enhance my newly gained skill set. Skills such as working within a team or dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty because I know in the career that I want to choose, or that I've chosen as a developer, uh, it's inherently innovative and disruptive, so there's a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty, and you really rely heavily on your team. So, like most of my cohort, I began my search on Google. I refined my resume, and I looked to my advisors for opportunities. I sent out four big applications to some programs I was really interested in, which was uh, the Coding Interactive uh, Opportunity at Shepherd Consortium, the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and the Socially Relevant Computing uh, Research Opportunity at UNC Charlotte. Uh, these were the applications I put the most time into, spent the most time polishing, basically the ones worth mentioning. Unfortunately, I was not accepted into any of these programs. And I think the biggest reason why is because I had trouble representing myself as an asset on my resume and cover letter. At the time, I was a sophomore CS major with a nominal portfolio and very limited experience. And with such a popular major, I knew that I would have to build up some merit before these kinds of programs would take me seriously. But I was encouraged by my mom to keep trying, and you know, you can't argue with your mom. So I kept my eyes open, applied to the opportunities that were still available, but I also secured summer housing in case I wasn't successful. And then something happened. The faculty posted online asking for three students to help develop an interactive simulation. And of course I answered it. But don't get me wrong, this was luck. You can't expect an opportunity to just fall into your lap this summer. I'm talking to you, cohort 14. But this one did, so let me tell you all about it. I worked on campus in collaboration with FET Interactive Simulations. I'll be calling them by their alias FET or FET Sims from here on. They are a nonprofit organization that delivers and maintains over 100 interactive simulations that teach concepts in math, biology, chemistry, and even more. Their topics range in difficulty from elementary things like simple addition all the way to advanced things like circuit building and uh, building molecules. But the best thing about this organization is they deliver these simulations at no cost to the users. And that's not all. They all the programs they deliver are also open source, meaning anyone can see the source code and customize the program to their needs. They do this because they have a mission to advance science and math literacy and education worldwide through free interactive simulations. Which brings me to the work Michael, Dusty, and I did over the summer. Since it is in FETSIM's interest to be as accessible to many, as many platforms as possible, they are currently transitioning from delivering simulations written in a programming language called Java, which can't be run on certain devices such as uh, Chromebooks or Apple devices, to using a language called JavaScript, which can work on any web-enabled device. In this way, FET is able to reach a larger user base. Uh, they're able to retain the population of people who can afford personal computers while still being able to reach out to the population who can only afford the less expensive smartphones and netbooks. So right off the bat, I knew I was going to be learning a new programming language about open source development and about team development. <laughs> Sorry, that was a little bit early. Needless to say, I was excited. <laughs> You may have noticed a few iPads laying around at the centers of these tables. Uh, they have a demo of the simulation we worked on over the summer. Uh, feel free to try it out. We worked really hard on it. The name of the simulation we worked on is called Fractions Intro. 
It is meant to be used as a teaching resource to introduce elementary age children to the, comp the mathematics behind fractions. We would use the original Java simulation as a design document, but we couldn't simply uh, port the software from Java to JavaScript line by line as if it were a human language. No, we had to start from almost scratch. And there was only one slight problem. Neither I nor any of my peers knew how to program in JavaScript. The only person who could program in that language doc was Dr. Viet. The rest of us had absolutely no experience. I also lacked experience in uh, using GitHub or any form of version control or working with a professional software development team. And because of this inexperience, I was uncertain what to expect from this summer. But I came in with some goals in mind. To do the best that I could and to learn as much as possible about myself, working with others, and the tools and practices that make our jobs easier. Since none of us had done any of this before, we were all on even ground and we each had a fresh perspective to offer. This was also an opportunity for me to look at this foreign language, JavaScript, and leverage previous uh, experience learning Python. Not only would this help me learn the language faster, but I could also judge the advantages and disadvantages of each. To eliminate some of the uncertainty, we spent the first week researching JavaScript and GitHub. We also pulled our knowledge when we first started working. Uh, we would discuss how to approach a problem and why we thought certain strategies were better than others. In fact, let me share, you, uh, share with you a story about our first attempt at drawing something on the screen in JavaScript. The three of us, Michael, Dusty, and I, were left to our own devices by Dr. Viet to discuss how we, would, how we would begin the simple task of drawing a number line with tick marks on the blank canvas we were given. Not even a label number line like you see here, but just the center bar. I remember we had this big discussion over what type of loop we should use, um, not even sure how we would get input from the user or anything like that, but just about the loop. Uh, when we had finished writing our different pseudocodes and implemented a solution, we presented it to Dr. Viet, to which he said, basically, no, this is not the way to do it. In fact, this is definitely a way we should not do it. And so we failed. But the upside was this. We learned a way not to do it. And just a week before, we wouldn't have had anything to discuss. Uh, we wouldn't have known where to start. And we, wouldn't, we definitely wouldn't have had a proposed solution. So even though we reached an unusable solution, we saw for ourselves how much we could learn in one week, and that wrong answers can be opportunities to learn. Teamwork was also a major theme of my experience over the summer, not just between the four of us, but with the development team at large. Each week we would have status and developer meetings where we would report on our progress, our challenges faced, and our weekly goals. During the developer meetings, we could also participate in the decision-making process of the organization. A lot of the conversation flew over at least my head, but to see their process, especially their record keeping, was eye-opening to me. The developer meeting worked like this. The meeting itinerary was created by the developers throughout the week in a shared document called the agenda. Every entry is initialed by the developer who added it, and during the discussion, the developers attached their initial concerns, and if it were ever reached, they would record a consensus. This process was essential because it allowed the developers to talk about what was important. A ubiquitous trope of technology is that it's always changing, and that if we want to keep up, we cannot repeat ourselves. By keeping a record of the issues, uh, that were faced, the conclusions reached, and the reasons why, the developers can establish practices, create a knowledge base, and keep each other informed. This learning was valuable even on a smaller scale between each other. To maintain coordination, my team and I would drop roadmaps and brainstorm to-do lists on a whiteboard, as you can see here. Each person would claim tasks and then work on them. Uh, we had to do this to avoid common problems such as a merge conflict. By that I mean when two programmers edit the same program and touch the same line, and then try to save their changes, resulting in one of them having to go line by line and pick what work gets to be saved. A visual analogy can be seen here. <laughs> by coordinating beforehand, we could prevent doing redundant work and continue on with the project. Much of the time we would communicate about the project on GitHub so that both our team and the development team at large could see our progress and offer advice. There were often code reviews when there were major additions to the projects. 
And I could go into exactly what they look for, but I think the values behind are what's really important. The code should be documented, organized, and maintainable. But most importantly, the programmers should be consistent in their style. It goes back to the idea that technology is always changing. Our contributions may persist longer than we are contributors. And inevitably, the code will change. So if the previous programmer shows some forethought and make the code understandable to more people than just themselves, there will be less technical depth when trying to make these necessary changes. I would say that every day we worked on the simulation was a day for opportunity recognition in the form of creative problem solving. Creative problem solving for us had many of the same elements as opportunity recognition. First of all, uh, a problem creates an opportunity. And second, there's usually more than one way to solve a problem. An attractive solution does more with less, and an even better solution uses tools that already exist. For example, every object we wanted to create on the screen for our simulation was a combination of pre-existing code from the Fed repository. Because of their massive code base, it was fair to assume that most of the behavior we wanted to implement had already been implemented, at least in part, in another project. However, we did encounter a situation where a feature present in the original simulation was not included in the code base. This feature was a dynamic label for the parts bucket. In the simulation, a user has the ability to drag these parts to an empty slot uh, for their fraction representation. Uh, and the parts bucket has this label, as you can see here, that should reflect the current denominator and the current representation selected. Uh, and while there was a way to initially set the label on the bucket, there was not a way to change it without redrawing the entire bucket, which used resources and was inefficient. So, after determining as a team that the feature was necessary, I opened up an issue on GitHub and made our case. The bucket is a part of the FET code base, meaning that other simulations used it. So, if we didn't make changes to it, we would have to change, uh, we would have to make sure that these other simulations were unaffected. In the end, the feature, I, uh, the feature did get accepted into the code base, and I can say my name appears in the annotations of a large organization's code base. To wrap things up, let me reiterate my learnings over the summer and talk about where I want to go from here. I wrestled with ambiguity and uncertainty by joining an unfamiliar organization and working with a foreign language. In the end, I saw firsthand just how much can change after one week and that I shouldn't be intimidated by things I don't know, but instead strive to understand them. I participated in making group decisions at both a larger and personal scale. I got to see the attitudes of an organization with long-term goals and how those attitudes are reflected in their programming. And I recognized opportunity every day in the form of problem solving, which culminated with me committing a new feature to the code base of FET. So what's next? After reflecting on my experience, I realized that working in a software development team is, that, is the type of work that I want to get involved in. Uh, it's something that I could get productively lost in. I've also realized that the best way to learn more about computer science, whether it's a new language or a programming paradigm, is to be involved with a project. So this year, I'm contributing uh, to an open source project through one of my courses, Open Source Software Engineering. And hopefully, I'll be able to start a few of my own after. As per EPG tradition, I'll share a mulligan I have. During this experience, I found my myself at times to be very frustrated with the work. I know that to work in a team, it takes patience and understanding. So if I could go back and change something, it would have been to work harder to empathize with my teammates because that's where I feel I was weakest. Thank you for listening. <laughs>